everyone. Um, I'm going to get started here. Uh, so this is session eight on side channel attacks. Um, and for people coming in, there is still a whole row available at the front. And it's fully open, so you can really easily leave if you want. Halfway, don't worry. And there's some seats up here, so please come forward. Um, so the first talk that we're going to hear in this session uh, will be EM analysis in the IoT context, lessons learned from an attack on Thread. Um, and this is really interesting, at least to me personally as well, because Thread is used in the Nest products, and you have stuff like the, uh, the Nest Protect Smart Smoke Alarm uh, has five microcontrollers, all with over-the-air firmware updates for each of the five microcontrollers in it. So there's probably a lot of interesting work that can be done. Um, and this will be presented by Daniel Dinu as well as by Ilya Kizatov. I'm going to do my best Canadian pronunciations of all the names, so you'll get to enjoy that as well. Thank you, Dan. OK, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I will start with a short introduction. Then I will uh, present um, our vulnerability analysis with respect to EM analysis of um, thread, and I will explain you what, what thread is. Uh, then I will present the steps of the most feasible attack we could uh, find. We'd, I will discuss a little bit um, what countermeasures can be used to protect against uh, this attack, and uh, finally I will give, I will describe the lessons uh, we learned and how they can be useful for um, other IoT systems and protocols. So. Um, how EM analysis work, uh, the attacker wants to recover some secret from a target device. Um, usually it's a secret key. And um, the attacker um, observes some computations with that key, and at the same time it um, captures the leakage uh, from the device using an oscilloscope, for example. And after he observes several operations and uh, the associated data processed, uh, during those operations, using statistical techniques, uh, the attacker um, can recover the secret. In this work, uh, I will focus only on electromagnetic analysis. So when you see side channel attacks, it refers to uh, electromagnetic analysis. Uh, Thread is a networking protocol for IoT developed by uh, the Thread Group, which consists of more than 100 um, companies from uh, various business um, um, sectors, um, major companies. Um, the one you see on the slide uh, are the fund funding member of this organization. So they are uh, actively um, developing uh, the protocol. Uh, the protocol uh, is meant to be simple for uh, consumers, uh, to be easy to deploy devices uh, using this protocol. Uh, it's it is designed to be power efficient and to run on existing um, radio silicon. Um, also, it uses um, IPv6 um, addressing, and um, it's based on a robust mesh network. What is also important to mention, it, uh, it, pro it provides security, so it's, it's designed to be secure. Um, so what, what is the motivation of this work? Uh, first of all, uh, in the last years, we saw a lot of um, tools, both hardware and software tools for side channel attacks. Uh, and these tools are becoming, uh, they, they have a lower and a lower cost. So it's becoming easier for uh, an, an average attacker or a normal uh, attacker to uh, perform such attacks. Also, we wanted to evaluate the effort um, required to apply um, electromagnetic analysis attack in um, the, uh, the IoT context. And finally, our ultimate goal was to answer the question, um, do cryptographic implementations in the network uh, layer of an uh, IoT protocol need protection against uh, side channel attacks, or uh, they are fine uh, without uh, any kind of countermeasures? So uh, let's, let's see this. Um, first of all, we, we looked at the communication security in this protocol. So uh, there are two different um, layers, and each of them um, 
uses a both of them they use AS uh, CCM for um, encrypting the communication and authenticating the the messages sent um, at each layer and um, the first layer is medium access control layer uh, it uses a uh, uh, the medium access control layer key, KMAC. And the second one is um, mesh link establishment uh, layer, which uh, uses a different key, uh, uh, MLE key. Um, essentially, when a node is added to a thread network, it gets the net network master key. It's a 16-bit, 16-byte um, key, uh, K. And from this uh, key, it derives these two uh, temporary keys, uh, KMAC and KMLE, uh, which are uh, used to secure, which are used to secure the communication uh, at the two layer. And these two keys are generated from the master key and a sequence uh, number, which uh, is uh, for for byte value. And after a certain uh, period of time, uh, the keys are changed. And the default value for a key rotation is uh, set to 20, 28 days. Um, then we looked um, how we can trigger some executions of cryptographic operations, no? because we wanted to recover um, the keys of the network to be able to get access there and control the network. So one of the first messages, um, a child, which is a node, who connects to the network um, is sending is an MLE parent request message. And here, depending on the sequence number of um, included in this uh, message, uh, the receiving router um, takes some decisions. So if the received sequence number is different from the sequence number of the router who is already in the network, uh, then uh, the router will uh, generate a temporary key using the um, HMAC function. And using that key, it will verify um, the tag of the received message. On the other hand, uh, if uh, the two sequence numbers are equal, uh, then the router will uh, continue directly with the tag verification of uh, the received message. Um, I won't uh, discuss here um, the attack on HMAC and if, how it works. Uh, I will focus on the attack on ASCCM. Uh, so ASCCM, uh, as you know, is a combination of CBC MAC mode and counter mode. And uh, an attacker can essentially attack execution of any of these two modes of operation. And um, it can control up to 12 input bytes. So it can control the source MAC address, and it also can control the um, frame um, counter. This is a known attack, was initially presented by Jaffe, Jaffe I guess, uh, Chess 2017, and then uh, by Oflin and Chen, uh, Kosei 2016. Then uh, it's important to analyze uh, the relationship between the master key and the MLE temporary key used in the network. So we already saw that uh, having the master key, uh, we can derive the temporary key, the MLE key, using um, the key derivation function based on uh, HMAC SHA-256. The question is, uh, is there any way to get from the temporary key to the master key of the network? Uh, well, uh, surprisingly, yes, there is a way. Um, and it works like this. Uh, a child has to send an MLE child ID request to a parent and ask for the master key of the network. And the par parent uh, will send back uh, MLE child ID response, which uh, will include the requested information. So in this case, the master key of the network. What does this mean? Um, it means that the two keys are equivalent. Uh, having one, you can also have the other one. So you have K, you can get K MLE. You have K MLE, you can have the master key of the network. OK, so now let's see how all of this can be changed to um, create a full attack. So in the first step, the attacker simply observes um, MLE advertisement messages, uh, which are multicasted by the router at a specific interval to advertise its presence in the network. And the attacker will simply uh, record this, a sequence, the sequence number, which is in clear uh, in these uh, messages. 
Then in the second step, it will inject Emily parent request messages um, with the uh, recorded sequence number, uh, random source MAC address, and frame number. And in this way, it will trigger um, AS computations um, on the target router. And it will simply observe uh, the AM leakage of those computations, and it's, it, it will save uh, the uh, traces for, for these computations and uh, the injected uh, input values. Then in the fourth step, it will uh, mount a differential electromagnetic analysis attack uh, to get KMLE. Uh, and having this key, it can come back to the network, send an MLE child ID request message, and um, ask for the um, master key of the network. And the target router uh, will send back the master key of the network. Having the master key of the network, uh, the attacker can also drive the it can uh, connect to the network, essentially. It can uh, communicate with the nodes in the network, can understand the communication in the network, uh, eventually can change parameters of the network and take full control of the network. OK, so this, this is how the attack works uh, in theory. Uh, let's see um, how it is in practice. So we used an experimental setup uh, which consisted of um, a TI uh, development board, which has a Cortex-M3 microcontroller, which was clocked at 32 megahertz, the maximum frequency of uh, this um, um, device. We used uh, the open thread implementation of the stack, uh, which is uh, uh, freely available. We use a LeCroy oscilloscope, uh, Langerian probes, and uh, amplifier. We also tried uh, with new AE um, EM probe, and indeed, in the figure, you can see the amplifier from new AE there. Um, and also, for the final results, we did not use any uh, trigger signal, so we tried to um, use real settings, uh, see how this can be done in real settings. So the results, uh, we, we had to use a sampling rate on, of one giga samples per second because uh, a lower sampling rate uh, did, not get, we did not get good results with our lower sampling rate. We were able to uh, measure 10,000 traces in about three hours, and this uh, amount of traces were enough to fully recover uh, the Emily key. Although we struggled uh, a little bit on recovering two key bytes. So these two key bytes were more difficult to recover. Um, we, we saw in, it, in the literature that there are also papers reporting uh, similar uh, problems. Um, well, we were able to recover the MLE key, but um, we had the problem when we tried to get the master key of the network. So essentially, um, what happens there? Um, is we send the MLE uh, parent uh, request message uh, to ask for the master key of, uh, for the network. But the answer did not include just the master key of the network, but also some default values, which were added by the router, were not requested by the attacker. And because the total length of this um, response message was higher than um, 127 bytes, which is the maximum transmission unit, um, at the MAC layer, it had to be fragmented. And because it was fragmented, uh, it was also encrypted at the MAC layer, which we did not expect when we um, analyzed it on the paper. And this uh, encryption with the MAC key essentially kind of um, prevented us to recover the master key. Nevertheless, um, the paper of uh, Offlin and Chen uh, shows that this is possible. It's just a matter of mounting another uh, attack to recover the MAC encryption key, and then having both MAC key and Emily key, you can get the master key of the network. And also, uh, we don't exclude the possibility that this attack will work just uh, with the Emily key in the case, depending on the way uh, the stack is implemented. So if the parent sends back only the information that the child requests, in our case, just the master key of the network, uh, there is no fragmentation. So uh, it should be possible to recover the master key only having the um, uh, MLE key. So how 
to protect against this, um, first of all, we thought, OK, you can put a device inside a, a metal box, for example, and you already reduce uh, the amount of uh, electromagnetic emissions. And you can make it also tamper resistant if you want to have um, more um, security uh, confidence in your uh, device. Also, you, uh, it's a very good practice to protect the cryptographic implementations uh, using well-known countermeasures like masking, hiding, combining both of them. Also, we looked at some protocol level mitigations, and maybe one of them is to limit the number of MLE parent request messages um, a router is processing in a specified amount of time. In doing this, you can essentially limit the number of traces an attacker can observe for a particular key. And you can also consider uh, rotating the keys in the network much faster than 28 days. Again, you limit the time the attacker can observe computations with the same key. And maybe also a cert uh, security certification scheme can be useful um, because it can provide some um, assurance that each device on the market uh, meets some minimal uh, security uh, requirements. And of course, uh, a combination of all this uh, is better and uh, provides a higher security level, but of course it's uh, more expensive and increases the cost of products. So what uh, we learned from this? So as I said at the beginning, I this um, helped us to understand what if um, electromagnetic analysis is a threat to uh, IoT context, and we think that our results can be useful for um, designers of IoT systems and uh, protocols. So first of all, uh, it's electromagnetic leakage uh, has to be uh, prevented because uh, it's really, um, it can be used to attack uh, IoT devices. Uh, second thing, uh, do not uh, create a mechanism to get the master key from a temporary key because essentially this violates uh, the key derivation principle, no? So uh, they, they should not be equivalent. And the third thing, um, which is kind of, it's a also can be considered for future uh, research is the fact that a network wide master key uh, seems to be a double uh, edged sword. It's good because you can easily set up a network. Uh, you have one key for all nodes, uh, but also th that this means that if a single node in the network is compromised, the whole network is compromised. So for example, combining this uh, with uh, some public key scheme uh, might be uh, useful in the sense that if a node is compromised, uh, the, entire, the, the rest of the network uh, is still fine and uh, can uh, work. So finally, I would say side channel attacks are a real threat uh, for the IoT and um, they should be, uh, this threat should be addressed uh, from the early design phases of IoT systems and products. And I hope all uh, IoT products will be uh, secure, and thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you very much. Um, so we have time for a question or two, if there are any. Immediately, yep. Well. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, just a question. What was the most challenging uh, part of the work uh, to apply uh, uh, your such an attack against, uh, yeah. against uh, the, uh, your, the target IoT device? I what was the most challenging? Yes, I, th I think one of the uh, first was the um, we wanted to, to to find a way to get into the network, like to find a network mechanism. This was one of the challenges. And after we had this, it was the side channel, the part itself. And indeed, uh, I didn't mention, but we spent uh, roughly two thirds of the time uh, improving the attack and fine tuning. So it's, uh, it's difficult. It's, uh, you, 
because uh, you also have the radio transceiver, and I think it affects the quality of the signal uh, you get uh, with the EM probe. So this is one of the difficult uh, things as well. Okay, so the tricky part was to, to extract the signal. Yes, and to, to, to get to these results, we, we spent a lot of uh, time uh, arranging the probe and then looking what is wrong. And, and in the end, for example, with those two key bytes, we could not, uh, we, we wished to reduce the number of traces to attack those two key bytes, but we were not able to do this. So it depends, the success of an attack, if uh, you will, uh, try to attack another device depends a lot on the time you invest to understand the leakage of that device and how to place the probe and these kind of things. Okay. Maybe a uh, uh, last question. Mm -hmm. uh, how, will be, how would you rank the expertise of, uh, of uh, an attacker trying to apply this attack on the field? Well, uh, indeed we've done, um, yes. Uh, so there is no kind of criteria to do this, but uh, we um, follow the joint interpretation library, which is based on common criteria, and we try to, uh, which provides some way to score attacks. And based on this, we uh, try to score our attack, and um, the final score um, suggests that this type of attack is an enhanced, enhanced based attack, so it's not easy to perform for someone who is not familiar with side channel attacks and does not have some minimal background, but it's also not a uh, um, very uh, demanding attack, like you need extremely expensive equipment and these kind of things. So um, in, in terms of equipment, um, though we use a liquid oscilloscope, we think that uh, mid-range uh, devices like PicoScope or uh, Chip Whisperer Pro uh, should work for, the, for the target we analyze. Of course, now if you switch to hardware attacks, uh, implementations, uh, and protected implementations, of course, you will need also to increase the cost, and uh, the attack will become more complex. So it will go on the right side of, uh, of the spectrum. Oh, it's OK. Thank you. Okay. I think um, almost out of, out of time now. One quick question. Uh, okay. If you talked to Nest or anyone, did they care? What was the response of? Uh, yeah, they care. Um, they acknowledge uh, our findings. And um, essentially, they decided, and uh, it's, this is also mentioned in paper, at Thread Group uh, to uh, elaborate some guidelines to, to make uh, software engineers aware of this type of attacks and uh, to prevent um, them from happening. So definitely it's a concern and I think uh, it's already addressed in uh, the thread, thread level and all companies uh, involved in thread, they are aware and definitely this uh, is not in products or. <laughs> well, thank you very much again. Thank you. <laughs>